Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with David Sun of Beyond EDC, a new knife company that's already making a huge splash. In the short time they've been around, Beyond EDC has collaborated with some heavy hitters of the knife industry. <clears throat> Pardon me. Think Demco Riverwolf uh, for a reference. And they produce three tiers of folders from the high performing uh, but affordable to the limited edition collectible. I got a chance to meet David at Blade Show 2022 and got a chance to chew the fat with him about his approach to the knife business. And since then, I've looked forward to further fleshing out that conversation. But first, uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, download the show to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen while you're doing other things, those things that you have to do that you don't necessarily want to. And you can hear these golden tones. Uh, and as always, uh, if you want to help support the show, go to Patreon. Uh, you can do that by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon, and there you'll see that you get exclusive content, interview extras, you get entered into knife giveaways, et cetera, et cetera. There are a couple of new things that I think we're going to be unleashing there as well. Um, more to come on that. Uh, but the quickest way to go over there is to zap the QR code or to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. David, welcome to the show. Good to have you, sir. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Glad oh, to be here. It's my pleasure. And uh, so, as I mentioned up front, uh, I met you, I had the pleasure of meeting you in, at uh, Blade Show. And until I stood in front of all your work and was looking at all your uh, all the folders you had um, to show there beyond EDC was still a nebulous thing in my mind. I knew about the river wolf, but where did it come from? So uh, tell me about your background and the genesis of this new, but powerful company. Oh, thank you very much for that. Yeah. This for the endorsement description. And uh, I hope that it will be as, as good as you say, uh, so what happened, let me just uh, go quick, I guess quick little bit about myself. I imagine I started like everyone else being a kid and just really, really into knives. Uh, I mean, when I first got into knives, we still had the Edge Company. I don't, I don't know if I'm showing my age by mentioning the Edge Company. They were one of those, uh, you can find uh, just a little bit of everything under the sun uh, in that catalog. Then that was also during the time when Smoky Mountain uh, what got into trouble with the Attorney General of California. Uh, so this is also bring back 20, 30 years ago when Smoky Mountain got sued by California's AG uh, for selling illegal knives into California. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so this is when I got started uh, and you know got into knives, start buying knives from catalogs. Uh, we didn't have on. This is so old. We didn't have oh, online yeah. ordering at that time. You had to actually write out your orders and send it in with a credit card or a check to the company for them to send it to you. Uh, so buying all the magazines, I remember my favorite magazine was still Tactical Knives. And they had a lot of really great articles. I'm actually working with Stephen Dick on some of the articles on Young EDC Knives. So we're hoping to see that in print soon. Uh, I, I hope. And so Tactical Knives was when I really got started into reading all about knives in a more focused manner. Uh, because before that, I was also into guns, so bought a lot of gun magazines, and they would usually have one or two knife articles in there. But it's kind of, you know, touching the surface a little bit. But Tactical Knives kind of got me cemented into becoming a knife junkie, if you will, uh, for, <laughs> for all ages. And uh, so starting from there, uh, sending sending snail mail to all the company that was mentioned on the back with, with their advertisement and say, hey, can I get a catalog from you guys? And they would send it over. And that was you know, part of my what I read when I had the spare time. So going forward into uh, college days, in, when I was in college, I actually started my own little knife business, uh, you know, try to, I guess, both feed my habit and also make a little from it at the same time. Uh, 
see, going then uh, into years of working the corporate corporate ladder, uh, then I met the what will be the genesis of Kaiser Knives in 2012 when they first came to the U.S. Uh, with a couple of their their first productions, and I think what I saw at that time was really what changed my view on what can be done uh, because all the way up up to that time i was i think i was still under that impression of if it's made in china i'm not looking at a good knife you know it's, it's going to be cheap it's going to be low quality and it's going to be use it throw it and when kaiser came to the us and said hey this is what we're making and this is the knife we're bringing to the us take a look and check out the quality I'm like, wow, you guys are actually doing something really great. So what am I looking at? $300, $400? No, a couple hundred bucks. Titanium, SFI VN? Yeah. Really? At this quality? So, But there was no Kaiser yet. It was just a company with a couple of knives that want to get started. Hmm. Uh, so working with the, the Kaiser at that time, or the Anmun company at the time, uh, we came up with the name Kaiser, started developing what kind of tier they want to get into, what kind of marketing plan they would have. So that was like my my first professional entry into the knife market, kind of dipping my feet into the water. Uh, after that, I got a chance to interview with Cold Steel, uh, with Lynn Thompson, and got hired into Cold Steel, started as their international manufacturer manager, uh, traveling all around. So I kind of had to cut my relationship with Kaiser a little bit because of the non-competitive clause. Mm -hmm. uh, but after leaving Cold Steel, I moved full time into Kaiser. So from Kaiser, Artisan, uh, Reich, We Knife, and now to Beyond EDC, uh, kind of tried my hand at different things, learned quite a bit over the years and still learning. Um, so it was Beyond EDC hoping to put all that into practice, creating wow. something, that, something that I would be proud to own and be proud to put my name and make sure my name is associated with it. Okay, so before uh, before we get into the uh, <clears throat> the uh, meat and potatoes about Beyond EDC, I have to ask you about some of this amazing experience you have in the knife uh, business. Um, I remember w the first Kaiser I saw. Um, I don't think it was the very first, but it was the first Kaiser that really um, turned my head. It was the the Matt Cucciara design. Um, yes, you know the which one I'm talking about. Trifecta, the flashbang, yeah, yeah, the, yep. And there was a third one, and that's the one that I got, and I can't remember what it was called. There Beautiful were, recurve Bowie that I, few, yep. I regret getting rid of that thing. The Dorado. Um, it's probably the one you the think Dorado. Of. That's the one. It was the Dorado. What a beautiful knife! And and I remember seeing his custom versions of that. And then I I understand he fell uh, he fell under ill health and he couldn't make them. But here was this this new company Kaiser that could produce them and do them beautifully. And the thing that really uh, uh, stuck out to me was that this was the first time I was seeing that that really popped out to me that sort of very contoured titanium that nice contour. The contour handle was something that you didn't really see too often in the market those days. Uh, but Matt was very insistent on we make it uh, to the same quality as his custom knives. And that's what we did. So we were able to take that using his custom knife as a, as essentially we're, we're creating a twin of his custom knives mm -hmm. and bringing the same quality, same design, uh, except at a more affordable price and much more easily available on the market. So at this time, say uh, when you're helping or not helping, but you and Matt Cucciara are um, collaborating on those earlier Kaiser knives and you're producing them. Uh, did Kaiser have a plant at that time? Was there already a factory in place or? or how... Yeah, so he... Kaiser history is a little bit odd because Kaiser grew out of TBT, which was a kitchen knife factory. Oh, okay. And they had quite a bit of booming business even today. Uh, the TBT is still a big booming business in Yangjiang doing kitchen knife. Uh, so the owner of, of uh, TBT, uh, he wanted to try something new. And one of the things he told me at that time was when he came to the U.S. for shows, uh, he wanted to buy a knife just to carry around. But he couldn't find any decent uh, made in China knives. And he was talking to his guys like, why don't we have any good made in China knives? And I said, well, 
you know, these are the knives that are made in China. It's like, well, these are super bad quality. Why, why are the good ones? There aren't any. Why aren't any? There, and no one can answer that question because it was a simple, simply that no one has done this before. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to China and you go to the OEM factory and you're not looking for quality. You're not looking for material. You're looking for price. What is the lowest price you can give me? And that result in a lot of things that you see in all over the place where you would not want to use that for anything more than just cutting paper. So CK at that time decided that I wanted to make something different. I want to see, I got the technology because I've been making knives all these years and kitchen knife, how different could that be from a folding knife? The truth is it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> But he's like, well, I got the CNC machine, I got the workforce, and I got the design, and I have the QA. Uh, everything is in place. Let me start a new uh, new uh, folding knife company and see what we can do. So he actually started from scratch, uh, grabbed a couple of guys who knew the folding knife mark, how to make folding knives, and said, okay, what do you need? Let me know what machines you need, and if I don't have it in the in the factory already, we'll make it happen. So from the ground up, uh, they made what what became the Kaiser factory. Wow, and <clears throat> and you played a role in that all uh, coming to 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 be. And and uh, so when you were working with Kaiser, were you a uh, sort of um, consultant or, or not a consultant? That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, like a distributor. No, uh, I was an employee. So oh. the first couple of years, uh, I was more of a consultant capacity. And then starting from 2015, when I joined full time, I was, uh, let's see, designer liaison, uh, product lifecycle management, uh, distribution, retail uh, management, uh, crisis management. So everything. Uh, <laughs> my, my fingers were in many pies in the Kaiser. Yeah. So it's kind of anything they they needed. Uh, I was the guy to do it. Uh, simply, it was easy for me to travel all over the place, and especially in the U.S., uh, travel to go to shows, to meet the designers, talk to dealers. Uh, it was easier because I had no type, no uh, well, no real time difference. I was on the West Coast at that time, so you know we had three hour difference between the West Coast and East Coast. But comparing to talking to China, where you had 16 hours of difference it was just much easier to have someone permanently stationed in the u.s right right okay so so you you uh get from kaiser all of this knife knife industry specific business knowledge um and then you go to cold steel another huge uh, or or a uh, a very well established huge international knife company uh tell me a little bit about that because um Cold Steel was probably the one that started it for me seriously back in the in the late '80s, mid '80s. Uh, I'm being generous by saying late '80s. So, um, <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit about what it was like uh, working for Cold Steel. It was definitely very interesting. I think that that sums up it very well because Cold Steel, it's it's a different because working with Kaiser, uh, you're working with a startup essentially. Mm -hmm. And you, everything was kind of trying it out to see how it works. And uh, everything was new. With Costillo, it was already a 30 year established company. Uh, it was much more regulated uh, compared to Kaiser. Uh, everything, there had to be a plan for everything. When you want to bring a product in, you couldn't just say, well, I like this. So let's bring it in. It had to, you had to make sure that it fits with the existing lineup, uh, you have to make sure it passes everyone's uh, criteria. And, uh, you know, we did have Andrew on board at that time as a, our chief designer already. So he and Lynn had to uh, critique and approve of all the different design we're bringing in. Uh, not to mention Andrew was designing all those awesome designs. So it was, uh, it's interesting to go from where every design you had to scour the market for, uh, check out the shows for to see what you liked, to where you already have a known designer who has a great design style and capability, then now you're trying to essentially try to 
complement uh, where something might be missing. Um, so it was a, a different different mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, then there was the production. Costillo did production in many factories. So trying to get them all corralled together was uh, definitely a learning experience. Uh, I would say that uh, I was very glad that in DirecTV, I was part of the crisis management team. So that taught me a lot of skills I was able to put into use at Co uh, Costillo. <laughs> crisis yeah. management skills. Yeah, well, I could see that. Uh, I've always wondered about that because uh, with those kind of numbers, especially with cold steel, they're putting out so many knives. Uh, and and I, I also happen to know that they're coming out of a lot of different factories and they all have a pretty good level of QC. It's just, it's amazing. It, and it's it's people like you who are corralling all of those different efforts. Uh, I, uh, I can take all the credit. Uh, Robert Vong. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, Robert Vong, the, the big Viking guy you're seeing that, yeah. that breaks everything on the, on the screen. He also... Uh, for all the proof videos, Robert actually builds all the backgrounds. Oh, no way. Yeah, he actually built everything by hand. Uh, and he does a lot of the testings, a uh, lot of sharpenings. And Robert is really the guy who you want to you wanna talk about someone who really like held up the back end of Cold Steel. Robert would be the guy, I would say, no less than 70 to 80% of the credit goes to him. Wow. So he's a he's a great guy. Yeah. He, he also does uh HEMA. He's also a very very oh, right. uh, hardcore HEMA pr a practitioner. That's so. historical European martial arts if yes. you're if you're unfamiliar. Okay, so so you're there at the birth of Kaiser which is a which is a plucky startup with a lot of resources. <laughs> and then you go to Cold Steel you 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 have uh, this gather this crazy experience um in in getting everyone on the same page for a massive production. And let's fast forward now beyond EDC. How are you taking all of that experience and funneling it into beyond EDC? Well, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, I would say, uh, because we have, so uh, I and the team, we all have different experiences in the knife, uh, in the knife uh, market uh, industry. Uh, we, we look at it very differently, but we try to work together to make sure that uh, we, we kind of become aligned in what we're trying to bring uh, to the consumers. And one of the thing is when I, when I collect knives and I admit it somewhat willingly, somewhat unwillingly that I'm a hoarder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, at last time I was counting how many knives I have just because I want to see uh, so after the, uh, there was a couple of years after my house got broke into, uh, so I, yeah, so I lost a lot of the like one of a kind, uh, oh, discontinued God. knives. Oh. So it's like, well, I better make sure I know what I have exactly. Let's make a list. After counting enough, I was like, okay, I'm, this is getting depressing. I'm, I'm really like, uh, like, uh, was it life, uh, AMC, the Hoarders channel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm getting to one of those guys, like, okay, I, I know I have enough knives. Let's stop doing that. So, I'm a, I'm a bit of a collecting uh, knife junkie, collecting junkie. So, when I buy knives, uh, there are a lot of knives I want to buy. And, but, you know, when you, when you look at how many you buy, you suddenly realize, wow, you're, you're not making enough money to buy all these things. So, for me, uh, how do I get that knife? How do I bring those knives into a affordable range? It was always a big thing. Is that I want to make sure that uh, it doesn't matter what tier you're buying from my brand, you will have a really high product to value ratio. So you might be paying 50, 60 bucks for a knife, but I want to make sure that you're, you don't feel that you're settling for that price range. Is that you're getting more than what you're paying into what you're getting more than what you put into that price tag. Uh, you're getting more either in, in the precision, in the performance, uh, in the style, the design, uh, something that you're getting something extra out of it. And when we talk about the limited edition, the Taramundi, like you mentioned, uh, John Demko's River Wolf, it's something that if I want to collect a knife, I want to make sure that it's something that I'm, I'm not going to have to decide between multiple knives. Like, if I buy this, what do I need to give up? So I 
I'm trying to achieve where a frugal collector like me, <laughs> frugal, uh, but still greedy, uh, right. <laughs> you want to get as many as I can. So what can I do to make sure that this is a reality? So that's a, that's something that I'm, I'm have, very happy to have a team that's helping me to achieve that. So you're, yeah. you're speaking directly to my heart and to my soul right now, David, because that's kind of, <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I am. I, um, from moment to moment, I'm like, no, I'm not a, I'm not a hoarding materialist. Like, uh, you know, I use every, it's the same thing. Uh, so that's interesting to see that that's the angle from which you're coming. So you just uh, s talked a little bit about it, but break, break it down. You break your product line down into three uh, categories. Correct. Tell us, tell us the name of each category and what it stands for. All right. Uh, the entry level, we call it beyond EDC. So here's where I'll, a little bit of a mix up. The Beyond EDC is our umbrella brand. It includes three tiers. The intro level is called Beyond EDC. And Beyond EDC, we're looking at to give you the maximum of value for whatever you're buying from us. Uh, so this one will be either G10, Micarta, uh, D2, or 14C, 28N, uh, things like this. It will always have uh, ball bearings to help you get that flipping out nice and quick. So beyond EDC is the intro level, but when we say intro level, we're really, you know, it's not, we're not skipping anything. The same product line as our higher tiers, we're just using different materials. Hmm. Uh, moving into what we consider the enthusiast level is asymmetrical. Asymmetrical, we're still working with designer uh, designs, uh, some uh, some internal designs, uh, titanium, uh, S35VN is kind of what we go as a standard combination. You will also have the uh, Macarta with ss 5 vn That's going to be coming out in 2023. Uh, so we're right now we're trying to get the River Wolf produced with the Macarta handle and mm. ss 5 vn blade. So that way you will get the design you want uh, at a price level that you can definitely grab as many as you like. And this can be your workhorse of a knife. And the uh, the the collector edition. The limited edition can be the show horse. So now you have one that you're not afraid to abuse, and the other one you can go out give you bragging rights. And then our uh, highest tier is called Terramundi, uh, working with uh, working with designers and the internal designs. The Terramundi uh, we're trying to do is only limited edition. Uh, currently, we're looking at 200 pieces each release. My philosophy on that, and again, it grows out of my own experience as a knife collector is that I do not want to re-release the same knife over and over and still call it a limited edition. So as much as I can, I will make sure that there is visual or substantial difference between each releases. Uh, so take the river knife, for example. The river knife, the first edition you see has a great titanium handle with M390 blade we have sold out of that limited edition. And for the next edition, for the next iteration of the River of, I should say, we're coming out with a dark blue titanium handle. Oh. So that you will not, mm. so again, it's, it's gonna be great. We use the ones, I would love to release, I keep on releasing over and over and over, but the collector in me just screams and says, yeah. no, you already bought the gray. Why are you buying the second gray? What makes that different than the previous gray? So I'm trying to do the dark blue. Uh, with the dark blue, I confirm with John which dark blue he likes. Um, that's already put, uh, the order has been sent to the factory to start preparing for production. Mm. And that will be also limited to 200 pieces. And, you know, if we come up with uh, the next gray, if you see another gray, then it should have a different steel or perhaps a different size, uh, perhaps something that should let you easily identify which iteration it is from. So you're now wondering, oh, was this released in 2022 or the 2024 version? Yeah. There should there should not be any question to that. Uh, so that's that's the one thing that I want to do with the uh, uh, Terramundi. And the second thing I do is the swags. So when you, when you buy a custom knife, it comes with all these little nice things. Uh, well, when you buy the collector edition from us, I want to make sure that I bring you as close to the custom knives as I can. And so what I do is the certificate of authenticity. I insist that my designer sign them in person 
by pin. You'll not get a printed COA from me. So that's that's one of the things I'm trying to do. And the third one, of course, is the packaging. The packaging is a Pelican-esque box, uh, yeah. waterproof, shockproof. It's got foam inside. We can make different tiers. So, you know, trying to do all these things that me being a knife collector, I look, I look at this like, do I want to buy this knife? You know, if I'm the consumer, do I feel like I'm getting something extra than just the knife? Yeah. So uh, there there will be work. I think we're looking at the next months to come up with Dylan Mallory's rate. Oh, and, yeah. yes. I love. Yeah. OK, Sorry. the 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 uh, uh, <laughs> my brain just went blank, the integral frame, <laughs> right? And we also have a couple more on uh, in the works. Uh, that's being talked about in our agreement with the designers. I think I just saw a shot of that. Has has uh, has Dylan released a shot of that new integral yet? I think Dylan I think released I just shot quite a few. Yeah, quite okay. a few of them. God, it's beautiful. Uh, okay, so um, this is something that uh, I really like about uh, the fact that you have this Terramundi level because. Um, like we haven't even brought up Dirk Pinkerton yet. You know, he's also one of the designers. <laughs> yes. that, he's one of my favorites. I, I own a custom Absolutely. knife of his and I have a, I have a number of his production knives and to see him in your roster is very exciting. I work with Dirk quite a bit. I think I started getting Dirk's knife when he was working with, uh, Myerco. When oh, Myerco yeah. had a couple of years when the they started warned. getting, <laughs> when, when Myerco started bringing out all the, uh, licensed designers, I actually had the chance to buy a variable broadhead directly from Dirk oh, cool. at the SHOT Show, the one year that, that he attended. So I already like his design. I just didn't think I have a chance to actually get one from him. And at a, such a gorgeous price directly from the designer, it was like, awesome. Yeah. He just made a fan of me for life. So with almost uh, every one of my uh, the brand that I work with, uh, Dirk has been part of the what I bring to that to that brand in terms of let's work with this designer. Uh, his design is both very practical, but it's also flavorful. So definitely for Beyond EDC, hey Dirk, you got a design that you can license to me. Cool. Let's let's get it going. Yeah. So, yeah. so well that that's what I was getting at is uh I, I know that he's at uh he's he's at that Beyond EDC level, one of his models. And I think one of his models is at the um, asymmetrical the asymmetrical third, model right. uh it's it's uh and then and then um and then you have uh say john demko with the river wolf at the terra Mundi. i i just like that these designers um can work across uh these three tiers for different designs that they have i also Absolutely. love the fact that the terra Mundi designers all sign the certificate of authenticity like you were saying before because that does bring you closer to the maker and it does make it feel like a custom thing. And you're also getting the sign off. Like I am John Demko and I sign off on this knife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, and that feels it, good it, too. And it's something that, you know, I always want is like when I get a limited edition, that's supposed to be, you know, one of a kind, but it's still a production knife. And that's okay for me because I've the, the price difference between a custom knife and a production knife. Sometimes it's a little bit, you know, more than I can, I can justify, but I also want to, you know, how can I get to feel that I want to, I'm, I'm owning a part of that custom creation process. So this was one of the ways that it was just, you know, one of the, the I guess, simpler, more direct ways for me to express that desire that you're not just getting a collaboration knife. You're actually getting part of that designer effort into that knife when you buy it what how how do you forecast what's going to sell um because production there's production times this is something that has always vexed me a little bit or or, or made me wonder uh because a designer makes a design or a maker makes a knife and then presents that design to to say in this case an oem oh, let's just talk oem okay uh and then that design is taken and it's put into a schedule and that's it. Could be a year before the yep. designer sees those yep. knives. Absolutely. And and what could be uh, hot right now might be a little bit cooler down the road. And so I guess it's good to get people on the hook early and get the pre order and all that going. But how do you how do you as someone who owns a knife company and you have quite a bit of designs, which I love. 
I like when companies have a lot to choose from. How do you choose what you think is going to be trending by the time it's produced? So one of the things I want to kind of point out uh, is the difference between OEM mm -hmm. versus licensing. Uh, OEM is that uh, when you when you talk about OEM production means the designer or your client bring a design to you and you're creating for their brand. Uh, you are not allowed to sell it under your brand mm -hmm. or as your product. Whereas licensing means that I now own the exclusive right to recreate that design for my company under my brand to sell it in the market. So it's a little bit different. Um, for OEM, you don't need to do any forecasting. That's whoever is ordering that OEM production does the forecasting uh, for themselves. For licensing, yes, uh, we need to worry about, you know, what do we look at as, is it hot? Is it, gonna, is it going to be hot? Or is it something that we can, uh, we don't necessarily think of as hot or not, but it's something that has meaning to us. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, there's no hard and fast rule uh, to do this. And uh, some of the things I follow is that I'm a very utilitarian knife user. So I love the artsy knives, but for me, a lot of what I get into is that the knife in my hand have to be able to handle multiple tasks, multiple functions. Uh, you know, you got to be able to cut boxes. You got to be able to, to uh, perhaps shave wood. When I go camping, I do want to be able to use it as, as a impromptu kitchen knife. Um, just even the cleaver uh, from EDC. I also want that to not just be the kitchen knife, but you got to be able to do multiple things. If, I, if I'm if i in a place where I need a knife, I pull you out. Uh, it has to serve any function that I put it to. So that is what we try to instill into our product. Uh, you're getting a gorgeously designed knife, but most of all, it comes with a function behind it. Um, and I believe that as long as this philosophy give us a, a solid footing in the market is that you buy a knife still mainly for, for it to be used as a knife. Uh, so as long as we don't de depart too far from that, uh, we'll be okay. And uh, there's also the emotional aspect of it. Uh, we just uh, signed an agreement with, with uh, Daryl Ralph on his oh, estate. Yeah. Uh, one of the things about Daryl is I worked with Daryl when I was Kaiser and got the Dunhammer license. Uh, I regret not getting more design from Daryl uh, when we had the chance. But one of, one of Daryl's uh, design that uh, I always missed is that when he were with Camelus and brought the Kuda Max. Oh yeah. That yeah. was a that was probably one of my first uh introduction into into both one of Darrow's design and into that flipper. Because before that I don't think I don't think we had really like flipper flipper yeah. knives. But with a Kuda Max you had a five inch knife in your hand that flips out like a butter dream. Oh boy, I couldn't put it down. Uh, I loved my Bowie Kuda Max. I kicked myself for not getting that Mad Max, the seven inch version oh. when, when they came out. Uh, I lost my Kuda Max during the break in. Uh, I made the mistake of putting all my knife into nicely framed boxes on the wall so that I could admire them mm. when I'm working. So that, you know, was not a good choice in, in hindsight. Uh, so now that I'm working, I, I signed the. Uh, a licensing agreement was uh, Daryl's estate. I'm looking forward to bringing some of the uh, Daryl's remaining designs under the Beyond EDC and put them out so that one to satisfy my own <laughs> my own desire to own another one of the of the Max uh, of the Mad Max, but uh, also try to you know uh, make sure that Daryl's is being remembered. Yeah. Uh, for the for the giant in the knife industry that he is. Yeah. I a, as you speak I have a Daryl Ralph pen in my hand. He sent one to me yep. and Jim after after we had him on the show. What a great guy. And 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 making um making unapologetically aggressive knives. And that Kuda Max, uh, that Kuda Max evolved into the Expendables folder. Uh, kind of the same thing. And, you know, uh, th this is just a little I was just talking about the Expendables folder the other day, and um, there was a missed opportunity in that design to use the Quillions 
as a wave to wave that blade open that because he he had it tipped down uh right was your kuda uh, max tipped down you pull it out and then i don't remember it's it's been a while since i had a kuda max <laughs> uh but uh i you you can definitely if you had a tip up that would it would work wonderfully as a right, as right. a yeah, wave or quick action. Yeah, quick opening action for sure. Because that, that comes up in my daily life all the time. I have to whip the blade out like that, you know, because uh, I'm a man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I am not. You're a man of the world. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're a man of the, you're walking the dark night of the city. You got to be sure. Oh, you know, yeah. yeah, these suburbs are rough. So um, now you have designs licensed. You have, uh, where, where do these get manufactured? How do you build these? Uh, knives and actually i okay i i want to get to something before we get to that uh i'm sorry i'm going to put a, a little pin in the manufacturing because i want to talk about that but before we get to that you mentioned something before too you were talking about uh, the emotional content of the knives it's like do these mean something to me not just like well worn cliffs are in let's make a whole bunch of worn cliffs it's like and you can see that or i could see that it makes sense to me that you say that uh from the knives i saw that you had presented. I don't know how many of those, uh, I know a lot of those have not been up for sale yet. Like that Pinkerton, that looks kind of like a Navaja that you had out there. And yeah, you that had, one is planned for 23. Yeah, it's a, it, pr the prototype is being made right now. Yeah. A lot of exotic designs, not, not exotic and goofy and unuseful, but exotic, beautiful, different, useful. And then, you know, you could see it just by looking at them in those three different tiers. Here I see my card on G10. Here I see some titanium. Here I see high end, and uh, uh, yeah. so and you're gonna see more of that coming uh, into 23 and 24 uh, during the Blade Show that we were just at. Uh, I was able to talk to Justin Lundquist, Nick Swan, uh, Rilla Conico, and a bunch of other designers. And uh, and so far we're in talks about bringing their designs under mm. the Beyond EDC, Beyond EDC Asymmetrical or Terramundi, and I I'm excited. Uh, to say the least, I'm excited to see what will bloom from from these collaborations for sure. Knives with emotional content, I love it. Absolutely, so, because it's a, it's a men's rule. You carry a knife; it, it, is. it is part of you, uh, and you invest some of you into that. So it has to be from a designer you like, or you either have an emotional content into it, or it's just something you you feel absolutely no emotion attachment and you can abuse it as much as you can i have both i have both the knife that you want to beat on i don't care what it is <laughs> just just take a rock and pound on the spine until it cuts through you know you, you have to have knives like those too yeah and then when it cuts through your attachment grows deeper and deeper <laughs> so there's nothing Absolutely. you can do so i want to talk about manufacturing um the the quality of what i held the and uh all of the Beyond EDC knives that I've experienced so far have have the very high quality that oh, that you. that you're you're welcome. It, it's I feel like we're spoiled at this point. Spoiled if if you pick up a knife that doesn't have exquisite action uh, or um, or you know or some of the materials bells and whistles, uh, you're being cheated. But in in your case, you're you're not only giving all of that, but a wide variety of of designs that seem somewhat complicated to make. It, you have a lot of different designs, a lot of different shapes and surfaces and such. I don't know why I'm going off like this. Tell me how you make these knives. <laughs> well, uh, before I do that, I do want to agree with you that today's market is so different from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had to do your research. You had to really look into what people are saying in the magazines, online, or go with the dependable um, manufacturers to get a knife that you can trust and you can depend on. Uh, these days, I think you have to go out of your way to find a knife that you will not get at least decent quality on. It's going to be a, if you want to find a knife that you can, you can scoff at and go, oh man, that's a piece of junk. It's going to take some work to do. It is, even for some of the cheaper knives you can find on the market, the quality has improved so much uh, that it, it's you have a hard time come saying that they're uh, junk. <laughs> so right. yeah, so uh, go, let's uh, go from that. Let me jump back in. Your question is that where do we make those knives? Uh, 
I think uh, anybody who's into knife in the market in the last uh, five, six years, probably going to be guess, be able to guess where my knife is made. <laughs> They're made in Yangjiang, China. We have two factories uh, that we own, and that's where we make our knives. So we have a we have more control over how they're made, uh, what material we use, and where we source them, uh, what kind of QA we put into place, and then we uh, and how we ship them to the U.S. and how many we can produce. So we we do have uh, I want to say that probably a more confidence in our quality control than if you were manufacturers by a different partner in the factory uh, just based on experience from previous. So, but in this case, uh, we own the factory and, uh, you know, we still work closely with them to make sure that they know what we're looking for in case we're looking for something a little bit different than out of the usual, uh, you know, like uh, all the little details, you know, all the file works on the spine, a uh, little, little uh, cut along the lock bar, uh, where do we put the, uh, where do we put the jinping, where do we not put the jinping. So those things are what we spend a lot of time on to make sure that we kind of shape the, the production, the prototype and the uh, production batch to the quality and the design that we want. But yeah, uh, I'm very happy with these factories, no complaints at all. So these two factories, uh, that's really cool. I wish I had two knife factories. <laughs> I could be like, make me a knife. No, uh, so these two factories, did you buy them? Or, or do you acquire a knife factory with, uh, this is going to sound goofy, but I've never acquired a knife factory. Do you, do, you, uh, do you acquire it with all the machines inside and a staff and who knows I, how to use them? Is it? You know, if you run on ideas, Etsy is always a great place to go. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, so beyond EDC is a partnership and uh, we have uh, we, we brought in the owner of the factory as our partners. So they're not just our, we don't just go to them and go, Hey, I want to make a knife, make it for me. Here's a contract. No, they are part of the investment. Yes. They, they invest into our brand. So they now have a stake in how the knife turns out because it is their brand as well. So, so this way we, we all have, equal share of the responsibility. Uh, I worry about the marketing and the product design. They worry about the manufacturing and the sourcing material, make sure everything is right. And then we come together to make sure that we meet in the middle, make sure that everybody does their um, their portion accordingly. Again, skin in the game, you were talking about licensing versus OEM. It's the same thing here. These, uh, you're, you have a partnership, you're, you are one. And yes. they have, and they have these. Uh, so it's a lot of CNC. Uh, do you use a yes, wire absolutely. EDM? Wire EDM. We do. Uh, yep, we do a wire EDM. Or we do a CNC. Uh, it, it just depends on what is being called in the design and in the production. Uh, the grinds are done by hand, uh, which oh. can be, which actually is a is a thing that I didn't really think was was was. Uh, prevalent until I started working with Kaiser and went to their factory and they're just this guy just sitting there grinding the knife one after another after another uh, if when you when we look at the so this is going to go back to a few years Dirk Pinkerton's Nomad uh, mm -hmm. that was one of the first knives that we we licensed and had a a torched titanium on the handle yeah. right and again it's just a guy free handing torching that titanium really he's like i i was like why don't you guys use the template wouldn't that make things easier he's like that's fine he knows what's going on he also has a couple messed up scale hanging on the wall in front of him like that's the one that didn't go come out right so he yeah. puts out there's like reminders like don't do that yeah. oh my <laughs> so gosh. it's a lot of so one of the things that i don't think people realize is that even when you say production knife you get the you get a sensation like it's all robots, CNC, <laughs> yeah. an assembly, put it together, a couple automatic screwdrivers come in here and just z, 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 done. Nope, it's all by hand. Uh, the CNC machine is by hand, clean it. The CNC machine, you bring it out, you clean it, and then the sharpening is by hand. The assembly, the tuning 
it's by hand. The and CNC the is just producing. I'm sorry to introduce uh, to interrupt no, you. The CNC no. is just producing the raw part, right? You got to take all the all the crap off of it before you even it, start making it. Yep. You get the okay. shape, you get the thickness, and you get the the rough, the, all the all the uh, all the bevels on there. But once it comes out of the CNC machine, everything is still done uh, 99 by 90 percent by hand. Yeah. This is something I just learned uh, quite recently uh, as a uh, good friend, Ben Belkin started his company, Jack Wolf Knives, and they uh, produce um, modern slip joints. And he's having them uh, produced at, at some manufacturer in China. And he detailed to me how much hand finishing goes into them because they are yeah. exquisite. They, uh, you know, they, they, Man, you know, you know how nerdy, or, or I should say, how um, uh, down the rabbit hole slip joint guys can get about fitting. Oh yes, and, and, and all the little Absolutely. things. I, I was shocked that this came out of a production uh, facility. And he said, "Yeah, the production part is. I mean, they're just they're making the parts, but everything is hand right. fit, Pro and everything." Production. Is in, so now the my now I've seen so much of what actually goes on in the factory. Production has taken a new meaning for me. Production simply means you're making hundreds up to thousands at a time, where custom means you're making small batches. But the actual amount of manual labor that goes into making sure the knife comes out at the quality that you de you demand, there's not a lot of difference. There's there's not a lot of difference. Um, and that speaking of uh, slip joint, uh, J E made. I I've, I've been to his factory and yeah, it's the same thing. Without all that manual labor, without hands-on work, it's hard to imagine how he can get such a tight-fitting slip joint just by automate automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's a, uh, uh, I mean, it's a, a demanding, like you said, it's a demanding crowd. You, you said if you want the fit and finish that people demand, well, that yeah. is what's happening now. Oh, yeah. It's demanded now that I mean, people almost demand that everything is on bearings now and uh, actually here's a, here's an interesting thing I, I love bearings i love that guillotine action but i also love the smooth hydraulic action of a sabenza for instance and I, I recently bought a knife from a company that makes watches and they're very into their navy seal frogman identity and they released a knife recently and i bought it and i i assumed that it was american made from the design from the makers and their marketing and uh, from the knife itself, it, it seemed to have that real American uh, sort of Sabenza feel to it on washers. Ends up Best Tech made it and they they perfectly emulated that sort of feel. And it doesn't feel like I have a, a lot of Best Techs and it doesn't feel like any other Best Tech. It feels like a totally different knife, but they made it and they nailed it. And to me, that's it's amazing. Uh, talk about spoiled. Now, you know, to get the best American made knife, you still have to go overseas. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what I mean. But <laughs> no, I just mean you can get anything you want now. Yeah. And and you can get it at a reasonable price. We have so many choices these days when you want to buy a knife. Uh, no matter what price range that you want to go into, no matter what material is your preferred choices, you have a, a cornucopia of choices. It's just, you know, if you're getting into the the knife market now, uh, this is some of the best times to be getting into knives. You, you, there, there's no, there's never a lack of what do I want to choose from. It's you never get to a point where you go, well, I've seen most of it. That's it. I've done. Uh, no, you you will never get to that point in, in today's knife industry. There are just you have new designer coming up every day. Uh, our geo folder. Uh, it's not on the website yet, but we put, we fo uh, feature this on your Instagram feedback. That's Nick's Nick Piat, uh, Ginger uh, uh, Blade Ginger. That's his first design, and it came out wonderful. So you have you have new and upcoming designers, um, and then you have the classic, you know, the gurus of the of the knife industry. It's a great time to be a knife junkie, an enthusiast. You know, it's it's one of those things that I think we are going through that renaissance of a flashlight that went through about a decade ago, oh, yeah. where you just couldn't get. You're gonna have to try real hard to get a bad one. Right. Well, 
I, I see from the uh, consumer's point of view exactly what you mean. But from your point of view, from someone who's who owns a knife business now and who uh, when you first started this hobby years ago, you mentioned early on in the interview that you had a small knife business. Yeah. How, compare and contrast what it was like having a small knife business 20 years ago and uh, and then now owning a knife. Uh, company that's making knives now what what was the market like what was the uh, knife world like then versus now oddly uh i would say it really hasn't changed that much uh because even so even though i make knives i still buy knives mm -hmm. uh, and when i buy knives i haven't really changed much in the way i buy knives or in what i look for a knife uh the the biggest change for me is that Instead of having you know maybe four or five choices when I look at a when I look at a particular uh, segment, now you might have ten to twenty different choices. Uh, and if you don't have a a company that you are absolutely set on, you also have so many more companies, so many more brands uh, for you to do research on to find out which one you like. Uh, you know, have do they have what kind of lineup do they have? Do they all go with a single theme or is it kind of a widely uh, branched out? Um, I think uh, using brands that probably much more familiar uh, to your viewers than say, you know, beyond EDC, uh, let's go with Cold Steel versus um, Spyderco. Spyderco does knives and they have knife all, their folders all feature that round hole opening, which I absolutely love. And they will absolutely not license to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, they don't, uh, Spectacle is very focused. You know, they do knife, they do knives well, uh, they do sharpening and do sharpening well. I still have my sharp maker, so mm -hmm. I love that. I'm a, I'm a huge Spectacle collector as well. Uh, and Cold Steel, Cold Steel is very different. And I can see based on your the wall behind you that you you're into martial weapons, and Cold Steel, you know, there's the folder, there's the tool, and there's the martial art weapon that doesn't really fit into any other category. It's a it's a very separate uh, list of its own. So Cold Steel, you know, they so the way I look at it is that when you want to buy something, you if you if you want to buy what well, um, if, you, if you're into what Spyderco does, you may not be into everything that Cold Steel makes, but you'll still be into part of what Cold Steel makes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have there's also the styling. Uh, Spyderco and Cold Steel, a very different style, uh, design style. So, you know, it, I think back when I was start getting into knives, you had essentially Benchmade, Spyderco, Cold Steel. Uh, I don't think Kershaw was that big at that time yet. And you had essentially these three or four brands that you would always go to Buck. There's always Buck. Mm -hmm. um, and my first fixed blade was the Buck Nighthawk, which I love. I still love. It's the oh 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 that that was yeah, uh, the the, the top. Hundo, right was the was the Kydex cheese. Yeah uh, yeah yeah. So cool. my my first folder was a Buck offer off a off a cross. Uh, so that was a so I also have a soft spot in my heart for buck yeah they got good stuff so yeah. you know you have these uh brands you choose from but these days when you walk into a store or you go online you go to blade hq you go to knife center and you say i want to buy a knife oh boy uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah your eye would just go i i don't even know what to look at anymore so we have a lot of choices and it, it the hard part is to choose the knife you like uh you can you don't have to worry about the quality I think just on any brand you choose from, but the hard part is going to be what style do I like or what material I like. And even then you still have, you know, just tons of choices. So it's a, it's a good time to be a consumer. It's also a hard time to be consumer. I've had where I got, you know, 15 different tabs open on my Chrome. <laughs> what was each going there? Which one do I want to buy? Cause they're all look so nice. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> I can't, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm always asking that question. I, I think it's in our genetics. I've come to the, I've come to the point of view that it's 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 either in our genetics or in our, you know, something so deep it may as well be our genetics. You know, our affinity for knives. It's it's a thing. It's like 
it's not even a guy thing. It just it's it's a human part of you that we we what separates us from the from the 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 other part of the animal kingdom is our ability to use tools and to develop those tools and to evolve the tools. So I think that's what where we are is that we're looking at tools and we're keep on thinking, ooh, that looks good. How can we make it better? So that obsession with evolution, uh, not just in biology, but in in our tools, is just so in, so bred into our our genetics. It, it's very natural to keep on looking for something better. So how is that, uh, that desire to improve the tool, to make it better, our oldest tool, the knife, how is that going to carry um, beyond EDC into the future? Where do you see your company going? What's well, what's your goal for the company? That's a very interesting question. Um, I suppose the the appropriate answer is to keep it going, keep it going strong. But the uh, reality, I think, uh, for me, personal goal, you know, not... It's, my personal goal may not be the same as the uh, what you might consider the the business goal. Mm -hmm. So personal goal is that I want to be able to bring more great designs into the market uh, for people to enjoy. And because that's what the other brands, uh, whether those who have come before me, before our brand or the new brand that's going to come after our brand have will be have done or will be doing is that they introduce me to new designers, new designs, new ideas and all these things that I really enjoy in my hobby. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm very fortunate and I'm very honored to have been part of this, 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 ev uh, yeah, both the evolution and the revolution in the knife market, uh, going from, I think, probably about 30 years up to, up to uh, this year is what I've been getting into knives. And so far, I've not found it to remain the same at any point it's always moving and so i'm always intrigued by what's around the next corner what new things will come up well man i i can't wait to see what you do with beyond edc and uh i i have a feeling just from meeting you at blade show and how excited and open you were and all of the designs you've already produced and and that you will be bringing to market that you've already brought to market uh, i have no doubt beyond edc has massive major long legs and you. Uh, you guys are going to take off uh i mean you already have but i mean beyond that because you're not only funneling your own passion and uh, for knives and knife collecting and your experience working at all these really amazing companies but you're also bringing in great designers not just legends but people with something to say through knives, and I think that's gonna that's gonna do you great. And I hope to continue to do that in the future as well, as long as I have the opportunity to do so. All right, David. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. It's really be a pleasure. All righty, sir. Take care. You too. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Well, in case you had to refresh your drink or run off to the uh, the loo, uh, David mentioned that they want to bring the River Wolf. Uh, the River Wolf will be coming back out anodized in blue. Uh, I am very much looking forward to missing that drop, as I usually do. Uh, but I can't wait to see it and get one of those in my hands. What an awesome knife they are. What a pleasure speaking with David Sun. Uh, I'm really impressed with Beyond EDC thus far. Such cool designs such a wide variety of designs uh, that I saw at his table at Blade Show and just an exciting future ahead of them. Uh, please join us in the future for another exciting interview right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Also, uh, don't forget the Wednesday supplemental where I uh, wax poetic about new knives on the market, new knives in my collection. And uh, of course, there's Thursday night, uh, Thursday night knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube facebook and twitch so join the conversation with us for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.